wow, 10,000 hours is kind of that conventional wisdom that it takes 10,000 hours before you're an expert in something. I guess, I guess Chuck's an expert now. Um, so that's incredible. Um, you know, we have our, our favorite wild places, whether it's the grandeur of the Keweenaw Peninsula that's you know, so far away and so big and so vast, or the kind of backyard, next door nature of a place like Ives Road Fen. Um, it, it's exciting and, and sometimes it puts me at ease kind of knowing these places exist and that they're protected for future generations. But again, we get back to the what is protected and what do we have to do to make sure something is protected and how do we go about that? So I think in this, this, this part of our discussion, we kind of want to delve into a little bit about what does protection mean? What does it mean to take care of these places? What does it mean to ensure that these places exist and are, are well cared for well into the future? Um, so we talked about Point Pele being, being a, a national park. What, what does it mean to be a national park? What kind of protection takes place there? What's, what's allowed? What's not allowed? What do you do? What can we, what kind of, can I go hunting there? <laughs> yeah. No, um, <laughs> that's a simple answer. Um, uh, National Park, that's in, in Canada, I would say that that's probably uh, one of the highest uh, sort of legislated uh, protections. Um, and uh, what happens there, and is, is the focus is on uh, ecosystem health, uh, ecosystem research, but at the same time, it's also too really important to um, provide uh, access for visitors, for people to experience. So for us, it's that um, finding that balance between protecting the ecosystems, understanding the ecosystems, helping to keep them healthy, um, and allowing people to be connected, to enjoy, to get involved. Mm -hmm. And at Point Pelee, one of the things you're trying to protect is, is that's in a major migration corridor. It's one of the world's most famous birding places. And so that protection goes well beyond the boundaries of just those how about Absolutely. 50, 15, 50? 15 square kilometers, 15 square which is kilometers. about eight square miles. Yeah, which yes, isn't that's all that right. big. Yeah. And so we were also talking about kind of the connection, not just the place that you manage and protect, but its connection. And for Isle Royale, it's a connection to Canadian Shore. It's a connection to Lake Superior. So what does it mean to protect, protect mm. that island in that national park? Well, I think we're fortunate. Our users are some of the best in the world. So the people who come and visit um, just really help out by making sure their equipment's clean when they come there. The, they just do a, a marvelous job. But you can't do it by working just within your boundaries. Right. So for us, we were really fortunate when Canada put in the um, largest marine conservation area in the world. Okay, um, so what is a marine conservation area? I'm not sure anybody <laughs> in the Great Lakes thinks of themselves as marine, but knows that there's marine conservation areas in our Great Lakes. Well, What's we are the inland seas, yes. Yes. so therefore um, marine is still an appropriate word. Uh, but Canada kind of seized on the idea that there needed to be freshwater reserves um, where you take a greater emphasis in protecting the fisheries, where you do look after you know the local communities, but in the process you make sure there's a sustainable uh, protected water environment. And we're fortunate that it butts up against the highly protected zone of the park because our, the our Royal National Park is actually three quarters water. It's, uh, it goes out four and a half miles from all of the different islands and uh, it's great. But and in working so basically I keep in contact with my Canadian neighbors. They, the provincial parks help support some of the corridors for animals to possibly migrate. Um, and one of our unique uh, partnerships is with the National Parks uh, of Lake Superior Foundation, which is helping me develop new technology for aquatic invasive species um, treatment in ballast tanks of ships, which is something you would never imagine me doing possibly. Right. But uh, I've uh, uh, worked with them and raised over, uh, we've worked $3 million and have a very high tech research program going on right now. So what's neat about that is that's from Isle Royale and that's, that's a global impact. It, it has, has a global, global impact. I went to Singapore actually yeah. and talked about the technology and uh, probably got a little more resonance there than I have here. <laughs> yeah, so that, that it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. That protection, that yeah. stewardship and that care goes goes yeah. well beyond the borders it, of those preserves and those pr pr protected it's, areas. It's all about people getting yeah. involved. Exactly. Um, like we can't do it ourselves. Right. Uh, so you know. It's fascinating to me when we were looking at the first video, we, we saw a couple signs of dedication or naming yeah. the parks. 
and you saw multiple logos on those signs, right? Those were, I don't know, four or five oh, different definitely. partnerships yeah. and logos. So you really can't do this type of thing by yourself. So can you give me some examples of Point Paley's where, you, yeah. where you're working in those types well, of partnerships? Well, one of, most recently, uh, we've been focused on restoration of our Lake Erie Sand Spit Savannah, which is a globally threatened habitat. And uh, we work with First Nations. Uh, the First Nations provide us perspective and focus on history of fire because this is a fire um, dependent ecosystem. Plus, they also help us along with, uh, we have a program with secondary school students where they come in and uh, they collect seed in the fall, take those seeds and then uh, to their school greenhouses, propagate them and then come back and we have volunteer planting sessions in the spring mm -hmm. to reintroduce the, introduce those plants into the savanna. So yeah, we, we would not be able to um, do that magnitude of restoration without um, all of those helping hands. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that again on, on the Keweenaw, it's a partnership of yeah. multiple, multiple organizations. I'm sure that bleeds over over the short distance to IRO. Well, it's, um, kids can really be creative and help save a lot of things. We had a small high school um, build um, underwater cameras that you can, right now I'm the last place to get zebra mussels, thank God, in the Great Lakes, but I still am getting them. And we actually, these underwater cameras, these kids have actually built and they come out and operate them. We can go and look un under our docks and at our dock with little disturbance in the water. So um, high tech solutions can help uh, us with some of the invasive species, but partnerships in general um, are making a difference. And, and the Keweenaw actually, that actually is my hometown and, and I grew up there. And uh, it's really the partnerships of conservancies that have stepped in and make a difference on that peninsula. And it's a mirror image of our Royal but our royal is fully protected, and the yeah. Keweenaw just has some very unique places. Yeah. Um, so we also were, were, were chatting a little bit earlier on about some of the other impacts or threats you face, and, and Phyllis, you mentioned, mentioned something like about airborne pollutants. And again, it's, it's not just a, a local problem you have to think about, but you have pollutants, um, heavy yeah. metals sometimes, that are coming in from hundreds and hundreds of miles away and they have a local impact. So could you describe that process a bit? Unfortunately, um, our Royal, because of its remoteness in theory, was the last place to get air pollution. But when they went out and did lake sampling, they found it was the start of whole, the whole air quality monitoring, one of the points of uh, data that convinced people they needed to take uh, t keep track of this. So right now, a couple of our lakes, you can't take fish out of uh, the mercury and um, deposition content that's in the body fat of the fish is too high. So if, as a park manager, I'd like to ha have you, if you catch it, you could eat it if it mm. made sense, but uh, you know, and it's not on all lakes, it's just a couple of our windward lakes that yeah. get the drop of, um, of deposition as it comes across the period. So it's, it's some surprising to me when I've gone to these places and I think I'm, I'm the furthest place from yeah. anybody, but still I'm facing restrictions on what I might be able to catch and eat. So, Obviously, these places had a big impact on your life's work, um, and that's great. So